Hi everyone, welcome to Daisy Stalls. In today's video, I'll be showing you my entire process of taking pictures of model horses. I'll cover everything from picking out the model to what equipment to use, finding the best location both indoors and outdoors, what angles and lighting works best, as well as how I edit my pictures and all the stuff in between. I hope you will find this video helpful. Now let's start with how I prepare my models for a shoot. For picking out the models, I usually have one or two in mind that I've been thinking about taking on a photo shoot for a while, so the choice is not usually that hard. If I'm not taking pictures of a new horse, these are usually my go-tos, and today I'll be taking Myrtle and Fletcher with me. I almost never take pictures of horses without some type of tack, so I'm going to pick out that next. This is my tack box, where I keep tack that didn't fit in the stable or isn't on a horse. Since it's fall and hunting season has begun, I'll be choosing this pack horse harness I made a while ago for Myrtle. And for Fletcher, I chose this western hunting set I made last year. And if you're interested to know how I made it, I actually did make a video about it, which you can check out. Now for putting on the tack, I usually do this beforehand, even if I'm shooting outdoors, as this takes ages and I really don't want to sit out in the woods and do up buckles for like 15 minutes. Speaking of buckles, they are very fiddly at this scale, so I really do recommend getting a pair of tweezers like this to help you out. I got these of AliExpress and I can put a link down below. The buckles work just like the full scale thing, I just have to be a lot more delicate with these and take a bit more time as well. Patience is a thing I wasn't too good at before, but after about 10 years of making tack, I've gotten pretty good with it and this stuff doesn't annoy me as much. After about 15 minutes, Myrtle is tacked up, so now let's move on to Fletcher. I'm starting with the bridle, which is usually the hardest to put on, but this one isn't too bad. I thread the reins over the neck, put the headstall in place, and then tighten the throat latch. A question I get asked a lot is how do I attach the bit to the corners of the mouth? And I'm here to tell you I actually use dental wax. I got this stuff from my orthodontist when I had braces, and I did not use them for my braces, but I still asked for more just so I had enough for my model horses. If you don't have braces and can't get it for free, you can probably just search it up online and get it wherever you live. Anyway, I pinch off a small piece of the stuff and stick it to the corner of my horse's mouth. Then press the bit on, and it should stay like that however long I want. And it does not damage the model, and you can just scrape it off when you're done. Then I'm moving on to the saddle. And since making the video of making the saddle, I actually made a breastplate as well. So I'm starting by threading that over the head. And I do up the cinch. These little clips by the girth are so fiddly and I spent ages trying to get it right, but of course you guys only see the time that it actually works. At the last minute, I decided to add a rope halter to match the saddle pad. Then 
That's how I prepare and tack up my horses. Now let's move on to what equipment I use for photography. So for my first seven years in this hobby, I only used my phone to take my pictures and for the most part, it worked out just fine. I don't use my phone for photography anymore, but I still wanted to include this as I want you guys to know that you don't need fancy equipment to start out with photography. Using your phone is just fine and you can get a long way with it. As I said, for the first seven years in this hobby, I used my phone, but eventually as I got more interested in photography, I started to get less and less satisfied with the results I was getting for my phone. So eventually I decided to buy a used camera. My parents did kindly help me out a bit with this one, but when I got it, it was totally a game changer. I used the Canon EOS 5D Mark III, which is a DSLR camera. To be honest, I don't know that much about different cameras and I don't really have that much to compare this one to, but I do know that I really like this one and I don't really have anything to complain about it. I've had this one for about two years now and it's completely changed my possibilities for taking pictures. Say what you want about how phone cameras are just as good as real cameras these days. They're just not and cameras are simply a whole lot better. The lens I use with my camera is this one. The name is quite long so I'll put it on screen. This one came with a camera when I bought it and again, I don't really know a whole lot about lenses, but I do quite like this one and I find it performs decently for miniature photography. I do quite enjoy the zoom feature and I mostly shoot miniature photography in its fully extended form. Overall, it's a good lens and though it doesn't allow me to get super close to my models, I find it works just fine for now. Now let's move on to how I pack my models when I'm taking pictures outside. I have these lined pouches, which I find to be pretty handy for transporting models. But to be extra safe, I actually use these fluffy socks, both as padding and to make sure they don't slide around in there. I never really use fluffy socks on my feet anyway, so I find this to be a very good use of them if I've gotten them as gifts or something like that. Though they are packed pretty well, I always handle them with utmost care as I really don't want anything to break. I usually just use a simple backpack and put the heavy camera in first, of course. Then I delicately place the bags with the horses in on top. Now that everything is packed and ready, I'm going to show you how I find my best locations and that means we're going to have to head out to the great outdoors. Okay, there was a tick. Even though it's fall, there is still a lot of greenery left outdoors, so we head out towards a forest that is not too far from my house. I keep my eyes peeled and look closely for any locations I think can work. The thing I look for first is flat places where the model can stand well. Even if you find a beautiful location that looks great to your eye, if you don't have an area to place your model, then you're kinda screwed. So I usually look for areas with very short grass or moss. Rocks can also be a great location, though I tend to prefer them if they are surrounded by greenery. But the number one location I come back to the most are dirt roads like this. I find they look great for miniature photography. The reason I look for specific locations like these are for the model to look in scale with the terrain. And that's really one of the key things I consider to make my photos look realistic.
I almost always avoid putting my models in tall grass or among any bigger plants as they usually take away from the miniature illusion and the model ends up looking too small compared to the terrain. Same thing goes if there are any pine needles or leaves that are very close to the model and obviously out of scale, and I usually just remove these if possible. When I'm shooting outdoors, I almost always prefer the weather to be sunny, but at the same time, I almost never shoot in direct sunlight. My ideal photo location usually looks something like this, with the light filtering through the trees. I find this light to be the easiest to take pictures in. It really softens up the picture and gives it a lovely warm hue, and I really like that. Overcast weather can also work, though I find that the pictures usually need more editing. The colors are less saturated and more washed out, and the tone is quite cool, which I don't really like, and it's not that simple to get a natural warm light when it isn't there. But regardless of the weather, I usually like to shoot with the sun being behind me, so facing the model directly. This makes for a very clear picture where you can see the colors and details well. There are some occasions where I choose to shoot with backlighting as well, where the sun is in front of me and behind the model. I do this if I'm looking for a more artsy expression in the picture, and this can look really awesome, but is probably not the best if you're looking to really show the details and colors accurately. Now, when it comes to camera settings, I'm going to keep it quite brief, as again, I don't have all the knowledge when it comes to cameras. First off, I shoot in manual mode, which gives me full control over all of this stuff. Now, most of the settings aren't really specific to miniature photography, so I'm going to link a video explaining all this stuff better than I could in the description box. The only setting that I find specifically important to miniature photography is keeping a low aperture. Basically, when you have a low aperture, you will have a very small portion of your picture be in focus, and the rest of the foreground and background will be blurry. In comparison, when you have a very high aperture, almost the entire picture will be in focus. I not only just prefer the blurry background look as I think it looks nice, but it also serves the purpose of blurring out objects in the background that are probably out of scale with your model, but when they're nice and blurry, they make your model look more realistic. Another thing worth mentioning is that I shoot with autofocus. I did try manual for a while, but my pictures ended up blurry because I couldn't really see what I was doing, so autofocus it is. I always check my pictures and adjust the settings along the way, and though this takes a bit more time, it has taught me so much about photography. Now when it comes to angles to take pictures from, there is really only one way to do it for me, and that looks like this. I usually shoot in a mid to low angle, as I found this to look most realistic, but it does require you to get quite low to the ground. This is where placing your models on a rock or a slight incline could be smart, as you can get that low angle with a bit more ease, and you don't have to literally crawl around on the ground. I'm going to get back to some more tips for angles a bit later in the video, but for now, let's have a look at how I take pictures indoors. I don't take indoor pictures as much, but when I do, I really like to use my stable, which you may have watched me make in one of my previous videos. I never really take studio pictures with a blank background, as I find them pretty boring to be honest. For lighting indoors, I like to use a softbox, which really diffuses the light and shines very evenly over the whole area. But if I don't have that on hand, I'll probably just move my stable towards a window, and that works perfectly fine as a light source as well. When positioning my models in my stable, I always like to imagine a tiny little backstory to whatever they're doing and position them mid-action according to whatever I made up. I also have to keep my frustration in check 
as tiny things don't usually want to stand exactly how I want them to. I also have to pay attention to all the smallest details, making sure the hands aren't bending in a weird way, that the hat is sitting on right, and that both feet are touching the ground, etc. Another tip I've picked up along the way for photography is to not only have stuff in the mid and background, but also in the foreground. This works out great when you have a high aperture, as the thing in the foreground will be blurry, but it will just add an element of randomness, which I find to look quite realistic. Here's another example of that. Here I am only focusing on my doll's face. Now one more tip I'll mention about the camera is about the focal length. Now again, I don't think I'm the right person to get all technical about this stuff, but I have a zoom lens and I can choose from 24 all the way up to 105mm in focal length. I'll take one picture with 35mm and one with 105mm to show you the difference. You can see on the 35mm, the picture is a lot wider and obviously farther away, but this is actually the closest I could get without it being out of focus. For the 105, there is way less of this fish eye effect which the first picture had, and I really like how kind of cinematic this one looks. It's also a lot closer to the model, and I can even get closer than this and it can still be in focus. Alright, I'm done taking pictures, so now let's move on to post-production. First thing, I have to import my pictures. I do this in a really cumbersome way. I first take the SD card out of my camera, then into my PC and import them that way. Then I upload my pictures from my PC to Google Drive. Then I can go to my phone and download the pictures that I uploaded. I do always edit my pictures and I use the Visco app to do this. When it comes to editing, I've also just kind of picked up tips and tricks along the way. And I wouldn't say I know exactly what I'm doing, but I have gotten a bit better at it throughout the years. So as you saw, I usually start by cropping and straightening the picture if it's needed. Then I adjust a bit on the highlights and shadows. Again, if it's needed, it can help to kind of soften up the picture sometimes. Then I go straight to the HSL, which is for adjusting the colors. I found this to be a very helpful tool. For example, with the orange here, you can see it totally changes the color of especially the horse from a more reddish brown to a more greenish brown. I can also change the saturation of that specific color. And I can change how bright I want it to be. And I continue doing that with all the colors, just kind of seeing as I go what I think looks good. I go back and forth a lot and there's no real rule to what I do, it's more intuitive as I've learned along the way. And I kind of went overboard on this one, it doesn't look as good, but you get the idea. Here's an example of a picture I took indoors. And the first thing I noticed is that this picture's tone is very green, so I try to tone that down and also just fix some other small things that I thought needed fixing. Here's the before and after. I think I did a lot better with this one. Alright, so that was all for this time. 
I really hope that this video has helped you in some kind of way, or at the very least, entertained you in some way. Now, if I haven't made it clear already, I will make it clear now. I am no professional when it comes to this. This is kind of more just like a, this is what I do and do with that what you will kind of video. I will link a few videos down below that explain camera settings, focal length, and photo editing if you're interested in learning more about that. But yeah, let me know what you think about this video. It was a bit different from what I usually do. If you want to see more of my photography, then I would follow my Instagram, which is linked down below. And yeah, thanks again so much for watching, and I'll see you in my next video. Bye!